The tribe of Naphtali, of course, another interesting tribe. And as you know, Jacob prophesied in Genesis 49, in the last days, as it says in Genesis 49 verse 1, the prophecies for the last days. So what we are reading about Naphtali now in Genesis 49 actually refers to the descendants of Naphtali in our time. And the same is true, of course, of the uh, when it comes to the prophecies of Moses about Naphtali later in Deuteronomy chapter 33. So all those things that we read in the prophecies, brethren, in the first five books of Moses, they have to be fulfilled or they are, they have to be in the process of being fulfilled in our time because we'll live in the very last days. So in Genesis 49, Jacob addressed his son Naphtali and in verse 21 he said, Naphtali is a hind, which is female deer or doe, a hind let loose. Interesting enough. This is prophecy for the last days. This a hind let loose can be also uh, translated as you know, a she deer running free, a hind, a deer though running free, as you know, the living Torah says. And it also tells us that he, Naphtali, gives go goodly words. He gives goodly words. So he's running free, a doe running free, and he gives goodly words. That was the prophecy for the descendants of Naphtali in our day and age. And in Jewish tradition, this is only tradition, of course, this is not a dogma, nor a doctrine, but in Jewish tradition, Naphtali, the son of Jacob, was a swift runner, and he supposedly ran all the way from Egypt to Israel to tell Jacob Joseph was still alive. Again, brethren, this is only tradition, Jewish tradition, so don't attach any, don't attach any dogma or doctrine to it, but it's an interesting tradition, nevertheless. Now, most famous of all Swedes, to you and to all of other people around the world, perhaps is Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite and smokeless gunpowder who established the Nobel Prize. According to instruction in his will, Nobel Prizes are awarded every year to the men and women who conferred the greatest benefit of men, on mankind in the fields of chemistry, physics, psychology and medicine, literature and peace. So Alfred Nobel, and now Sweden in his stead, truly gives goodly words. In Judges chapter 4 and verse 6 and Judges 5 verse 1, again I won't be reading all the references, I'll give you all the Bible references, but for the sake of all the saving time, I just will just refer you to those chapters. In Judges again 4, 6 and 5, 1, we have the song of Deborah and Barak. Deborah was a prophetess and Barak was a kind of judge. And, you know, the Song of Deborah and Barak may have been written by Barak, who was actually from Naphtali. And that song is full of goodly words. Now, a she-deer, or a doe running free, may refer to Sweden's reputation for sexual freedom. Sex is treated more frankly and sex instructions is given in all schools without any shame, brethren. So, <laughs> so that's probably what it is referred to. And Sweden has also been well known for this kind of sexual freedom and, and looseness. Now, historically, also Swedes have tended to marry later in life than the people of many other European countries, partly because they marry late, you know, is that they have developed an unusual tolerant attitude toward premarital sexual relations and out of wedlock pregnancies. That was all a tradition in Sweden. And it was a leading tradition uh, among all the other European countries. It was, you know, sometimes it has been estimated that 40%, at least in the last century, of all firstborn babies are conceived before marriage. And some of these pregnancies, however, may be attributed also to the continuing existence of an ancient rural tradition to delay marriage until a child is conceived. So there was that tradition. In any case, again, sexual freedom and that sexual looseness, that seems to be uh, the fulfillment of a she-deer running free. However, a she-deer running free may also refer to the fact that women have outnumbered men in Sweden ever since the first census. Also, 
In keeping with Sweden's steady advance toward economic and social equality for its people, the constitution of Sweden was revised in 1975 and 1979, and these revisions reduced the powers of the monarch and made the firstborn child to the royal couple rather than the firstborn male heir to the throne. So you see the right for women, the women that enjoy it also have always enjoyed great right, uh, great right in Sweden. Interestingly, the national anthem of Sweden is called Thou Ancient, Thou Free Born. Now there is, you know, strong pressure in Sweden. There has always been strong pressure to break down barriers between traditional male and female occupations. So in, you know, in the last century, a larger proportion of women between the ages of 20 and 65 worked outside the home than in most other industrial nations. So that was interesting. Also, average wages for women in manufacturing in 1980, for example, were about 90% of wages for men, compared to about 75% in Great Britain at that time. So women have also had the right to vote since 1921. There were 80 women in, for example, in the last century at one point, in 1978, there were 80 women in the Riksdag, basically in the Swedish parliament. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the, I think today, perhaps they have a female prime minister, or there were several female prime ministers, which is very unusual, brethren, for the European countries, even for America. Now, even Barack, you know, wanted Deborah to come with him, which is a sort of women's or women's liberation. A she deer running free could also refer to the fact that out one out of five Swedes is a member of a sports club and nearly all participants participants in sports are amateurs. Sweden have long been noted for their interest in physical fitness. Gymnastics are an important part of the physical education curriculum in public schools. Love of recreation is a Swedish characteristic, brethren. They're known for that. And that becomes obvious, you know, to any visitor to Sweden and <laughs> becomes obvious to, uh, to all of us who have had a, a chance to see Swedish, Swedish foreigners come to our countries. They just do all sorts, of, all sorts of recreation, brethren. Camping, hiking. They have those huge Swedish woodlands and they do boating along the coast. Uh, boating on the, new, on the numerous lakes. They're exceptionally popular pastimes in Sweden. Soccer or football, ice hockey, skiing and skating are a f just few of the sports in which Swedish people of all ages participate. Then also they love orienteering. You know, it's an exercise combining cross-country running and the use of a compass. Gymnastics are obligatory in school and in the military service, and many businesses have voluntary gymnastics programs. Since most Swedes are entitled to four weeks paid vacation a year, they have ample opportunities to indulge in their passion, you know, for recreation. Now, Deuteronomy 33, the uh, prophecy of Moses for Naphtali, Deuteronomy 33, verse 23, it says, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and fool, with the blessings of the eternal, possess thou the west and the south. Or as Fenton would translate it, he possesses the tides of the sea. Or, here is one Jewish translation, he shall occupy the sea and the area to its south. Now, anciently, brethren, that was the Sea of Galilee. Or Kinnerath, it was an anti-type of what Sweden does occupy today. Because today Sweden does occupy the sea, the Gulf of Bothnia and the Baltic, and the area to its south was owned by Sweden until 1721. In fact, Sweden owned parts of North Germany, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania until 1721. And no doubt, even though the political boundaries have changed, there are Swedes still living in these areas today. So there will be some remnant of the Israelites in those nations. Sadly, those three nations that I mentioned to you, along with Germany, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, are just almost as equally Nazi-oriented 
or were, or even today, are Nazi-oriented as, unfortunately, Germans are. They still have the marches in honor to their Nazi heroes. Yes, Estonia, Lithuania, Lithuania, and Latvia. You, you barely hear it in your news, but, you know, those of us who are involved in research of the Holocaust, we are well aware of that. They were all allies to Germany in the Second World War, and many of them were guards in the Nazi concentration camps, and many of them, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, did not even wait for the Germans to occupy their countries. They did rid, they got rid of their Jews themselves. The particular tragedy is in Lithuania. There were several vibrant Jewish communities there. They were all basically destroyed by the Lithuanians, not by the German Nazis. So, you know, this is sad, but it's true part of the history. Now, of all the countries of Europe, no one has a higher standard of living than Sweden. That was always the case here in Europe. And today, Sweden is one of the most advanced industrial countries in the world. The reasons for Sweden's giant strides, of course, can be found in its people, its land, its industries, and its history. Now, of course, Germany is now taking over, as it has been prophesied. But in the last century, we're speaking of the last century, in the last century, in the 20th century, Sweden basically had the highest living standard in Europe. And elsewhere sweden was a paradise brethren paradise when it comes to economy when it comes to social justice when it comes to social uh, overall social arrangement of their society well all the scandinavian countries more or less were like that until recently now the reasons for as i said they have got all sorts of advantages and modern households they in the in, for example in the middle of the last century Modern household appliances were found in nearly every Swedish home, brethren. Sweden had more telephones and radios in proportion to its population than any country in the world, with the exception of the United States, of course. Now, almost every Swedish family traditionally has had its own automobile. And many families also own one or more mopeds, famous mopeds, motor-driven motor bicycles. Sweden is, was blessed by God with a variety of natural resources, including dense forests, abundant water power, and rich mineral deposits. Its standard of living was brethren unsurpassed. Again, it was paradise. It was paradise for many people from the Balkans who went and emigrated to, to live in Sweden. Rachel was very the mother of Nephtali, was true, when in Genesis 30, verse 8, Rachel said, With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she called his name Nephtali. Nephtali, brethren, means wrestling. And indeed, how is this fulfilled? Well, Sweden, as a nation, has fought with Denmark, Germany, France, and Russia, and yet has ended up prevailing over them all in prosperity and standard of living. So now you know and understand who are the modern descendants of Naphtali. It's Sweden. 